It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning, to be able to worship with you for a few moments. On behalf of Diane and myself, uh, uh, we're just so honored. We've been looking forward to this for so long. Uh, sorry it's taken us this long to, to get back and visit with you. I hope uh, most of you were in the class where I was able to give just a glimpse of, of of the doors that God has opened to us in India and what we do and why we do it and and uh, and and a lot of the the things that I like to talk about we we've already shared uh, I'm going to give a, a little lesson with uh, uh, some success stories uh, about India kind of incorporate an evangelistic lesson with some of our stories and I hope that you leave here encouraged proud of what we're doing and so proud that you are uh, working side by side with us in, in our efforts uh, efforts there. As uh, I mentioned earlier, and oh, by the way, if you're a visitor like I am, uh, welcome. You are our honored guest and so happy that you could be doing a lot of different things and you chose to be here today and we appreciate that and, and heard there's a meal after, so I'm going to make it quick, all right? <laughs> I... Uh, I guess, um, I guess I want to begin by just letting you know, first of all, uh, Josh, I'm not a preacher, okay? I, I, I didn't go to preaching school, and, 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 but I teach a lot, and I teach a lot uh, in India. That, that's kind of what we, <laughs> Diane and I, do uh, when we go to India. Uh, they're much better preachers than we are, and we leave that to them, but, but I'm a teacher. We have... Uh, depending on the season, anywhere from three to five schools that we operate and teach at and oversee, and that's kind of our, our MO while we're in India. And so I'm going to give you some stories and a little bit of backdrop of what we do and why we do, and uh, it'll give you a little glimpse of um, uh, what mission work is like uh, in India, because we get this question a lot, what, what's it like in India, Joe? What, is it something I can do? Uh, well, listen closely, and, and, and you'll have uh, my opinion. I, I, and I need to say that my first trip in India was 1989. Uh, so I've been over there 33, 34 years. Uh, I've made, I don't know how many trips I've lost count, well over 55. Uh, Diane's been on uh, at least a dozen, maybe 13 trips with me. Uh, she goes with me uh, now that we're, we're kind of both retired. I was a small business owner in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, Diane uh, is a registered dental hygienist for years, and when we retired, we this is what we do full time now. So that's a little backdrop uh, about us. Uh, and I could literally spend hours. I've told some of you earlier after class, I could spend hours <coughs> telling you of what I would consider success stories of what we've done and accomplished. There are many, and I could lecture you endlessly because I love history about the history of India and our, the church's presence in India. And uh, for those of you who were uh, in class know that India is a special place to us. Why? Uh, because they're like the Bereans. They have an open mind to study scripture. And where do you find that these days in our neighborhoods? Uh, uh, I think I was a lot like Arkansas and that... Uh, you knock some doors in your neighborhood, and good luck. <laughs> you know, uh, India is not that way. And so, I want to start by just letting you know we work in an area that's poor by UN standards, by our standards. India is a third world country trying to become a second world country, and there are a lot of Christians there. We've been in India since the '60s. And there are more than 130,000 congregations, which is more than North America, Central America, and South America combined. And just to let you know that, man, where, where people are open like the Bereans are, this is the results. And we just thank you for being a part of this open door. Uh, the book of Jose, Diane, if you give me that slide. Uh, the book of Jose is not a book that gets studied much. I don't, I don't think. Uh, but I'm going to jump off uh, the things I want to share with you this morning in the book of Jose, chapter 8, verse 7. And it says this, interestingly, 
You have sown the wind, and you will reap the whirlwind. Anybody ever read that verse? Anybody know what that verse is talking about? One afternoon, I was talking to our oldest son, Aaron. And I'm not saying this just to brag about Aaron. I kind of am. Uh, but Aaron has a PhD in astrophysics. He works at Caltech and is involved in some projects in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with NASA. And I say that to say the dude knows math. Okay? <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he, uh, he's quite the mathematician. And we were reading this verse and talking about this, and he says, you know, uh, that verse we call in mathematics the butterfly effect. Meaning metaphorically that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, we get a tornado in Texas. That's the butterfly effect. That how can something so small have such great effect? And that's essentially what the butterfly effect is. He goes, we call it mathematics the chaos theory or the butterfly effect. He goes, it happens uh, in, in systems such as traffic patterns. Anybody been on a four or five, we were in LA recently, 12 lanes <laughs> of traffic, and one little car has a flat, or runs out of gas. What happens on that interstate? What happens on I-5? Traffic for miles, hours, literally hours of delay, all because of a little tiny cause. That's the butterfly effect. It happens in traffic, it happens in weather. Weathermen know this mathematic equation of, of the butterfly effect. Uh, it happens in computer systems. For those of you who are software engineers, you know that little tiny things. And Aaron would agree that it happens in space when he measures different gravitational pulls. And he takes measurements of things that are gonna affect our travel going to Mars in a few years. And they know that an asteroid, just a minute, small size, going by in the wrong place, will cause havoc for NASA. There's a professor at MIT in the 1960s that coined the phrase, butterfly effect. Well, I'm here to tell you, God talked about the butterfly effect long before a professor at MIT in the 1960s. Because at the center of chaos theory, at the center of this mathematic equations are this, tiny little minute decisions have great effects, whether you know it or not. And it happens in scripture as well. What science has come to recognize and proven with this mindset that little things have dramatic effects, I wanna take you back to the time of Hosea. And the reason this verse is in Hosea 8, verse 7, is because Israel was at an interesting time. 8th century BC, God's about to allow Assyria to take them over, and the people are yelling and screaming and stomping their feet, going, What's happened, God? What did we do that was so bad? And you know what God's reply was? Wasn't one thing. Is a million tiny little decisions that you made over a period of time. You sowed the wind, and now you're about to see a tornado. Wow. Because of your minute at the moment, you didn't think anything of it. It was just a little something. You didn't give it a second thought. And God said, I'm about to tell you how I work. Let me share an example of a butterfly effect in our work in India. And I'm going to give you a couple more in the New Testament. One morning, an Indian woman named Radha knocked at a door, uh, answered a knock on her door just two months after becoming a widow. She had small children whom she dearly loved. But she struggled to provide the basic necessities of life for not just herself, but for her children. After her 
husband had a car accident that took his life. And at the door, a government official stood asking her to prove that she can take care of these children or they're going to take them. Was she able to keep her children fed and clothed and protected? Or would she have to do like so many Indian widows? Let the government take them off. Orphanages in India are illegal. Orphans are too valuable to the Indian government to have even a Christian orphanage take care of widows such as Radha. Over a thousand years of Hindu tradition is working against her and widows like her even today, and maybe you've read some recent articles in our newsletter containing issues of widows in the churches throughout India. For generations, for generations, the, uh, the British controlled India, and, in, and Britain would admit historically it was the hardest thing for them to accomplish in India, and that was to do away with the practice of suti. Anybody ever heard of that practice? Suti, until 1967, India had a law in its books for the first time ever that said this practice was illegal if it was enforced by force. But the practice is allowing a widow to, at the burial, technically there's no burial in India. They don't bury bodies. They burn them. And so when your husband passes away, they go down the river bank or the canal, banks of the canals and they have a big pyre made, a big stack of wood, and they place the body and the bodies burn, the ashes are burned. That's what Hindus do. A good, pure Hindu woman, faithful Hindu woman, would place her body on those ashes voluntarily in the practice called suti. And throughout centuries, and Britain struggled with this, how to deal with this. What do you do with widows in our society? Because even though that practice is rarely done now, there's no place in society for women like Radha. Even though that practice, because in the Hindu society, widows were to never exist. So let me give you some backdrop. A widow cannot go back to her home. She can't own property. She can't work. She can't have a job. No one will give her a job. She can't go back to her parents because the dowry is already paid. And it would be a shame, a traditional shame, to go back home. It's never done. If she has grown children, they will not bring her to their home. And so what is a widow to do? They go to the streets and they beg. That's what a widow's expected to do. If she has an opportunity to marry again, she can't bring her children to the marriage. Just a small taste of life in India for a widow. There are two, maybe three cities that I know of in India that the government set up because of the issue of widows, so many living widows. What do we do with them? There are cities set up that if they can afford to migrate to, there'll be housing and food for them. And not much of that. That's their hope. And so as I was discussing with, in the class this morning, who do you think the gospel appeals to most when we go to a village? Who are the people who have the least amount of hope in India? The widows. Ladies like Radha. There was a meeting that I had with the leaders of a congregation that Radha attended. And they said, Joe, we need some help. And I said, what do you mean you need some help? 
He said, we have this lady named Rada. She's a phenomenal Bible teacher, and she's distraught. She's about to lose her children. Here's what we're going to do for her. And it's not enough. And we need some help. We need you to help us. But we'd like to set her up in business because nobody will hire her. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a business frontage. Uh, we'll rent a place in town. And she's a really good sewer. She's good with a good with a sewing machine. So if you can help us purchase a sewing machine, we'll do the rest and set her up in business and we'll be her best customers. I told that story when I come home to a couple of small congregations of about 30 to 50 in Arkansas, and it touched their hearts, and they said, we'll do it, we'll, we'll buy a commercial sewing machine unit and a regular sewing machine unit and give her inventory, and they raised $1,000, and we gave it to those, those leaders of that church, and they set her up in business, and Rada got to keep her children. Not only that, she put them through college, she put herself through college and has a wonderful job as an RN now, which pays really well in India. But let me tell you the real success of that story. And Rhonda doesn't even know much of it. There was a chief of police in that village who knew that she was a widow who was being used to seeing on the corner begging for money. And he was curious. And he wanted to know who was it that funded this widow and who did this to her that she can now take care of her children, and he was very inquisitive, showed up to church one morning. He's now an elder at that congregation, along with two village, other village elders, because they were so impressed. They were so impressed that they could not believe, they had never seen it done before, who would love a widow that, like that to set her up in business? She owns property now unheard of. As you can imagine, word spread. In fact, the county paper, newspaper, came in and did an article about it. She was on the second page of the newspaper one month, all about how this group of small people, this small group of people in this, this small village, how they loved a woman named Rada. And I'm telling you, word spread all over the country. And because of that story, we told that story to other churches. And they said, well, we'd like to help a widow like Rada. And we raised over a quarter million dollars in one year. And we have thousands of widows waiting in line for a business. Maybe not a sewing business. Maybe a small vending business. Rada never knew of the small, tiny decision a small congregation in Arkansas made. And that congregation in Arkansas will never know the ripple effect, the butterfly effect, that just telling that story has done to congregations all across India. That's the chaos theory at work. That's the butterfly effect. And I've seen stories like this over and over. And I'm just here to tell you, you don't have to have a PhD in missiology. You don't have to be a great preacher like Josh <laughs> to go to a second, third world country. You say, Joe, I can't go to India. I can't preach. You don't understand how God works. Did God ever choose the best for anything in Scripture? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, goodness gracious. Um, but my conversation with Aaron reminded me how great God is and the way he does things. And can I, can I go back to Scripture and just give you a couple of Old Testament examples of the butterfly effect that you didn't even really realize, maybe, or even thought about until maybe this morning? How about that small, tiny decision? How about this one? Just a bite of a piece of fruit, right? Who would have thought 
You and I pay the penalty of that by today, right? <laughs> that may be the ultimate butterfly effect throughout time. They had no idea. I am positive. They had no idea. Thousands, millennia later, God says, I had an effect. You didn't know it. You didn't realize it. Or how about the next one? This is one of my favorites as well. Uh, that's Abraham, by the way. <laughs> and his lovely wife, Sarah. Do you think they would have ever in their wildest dreams believed? They were just trying to help God. God, You remember? God gave him a promise. Your first son is supposed to be Isaac. But God needed help. <laughs> So who was the first son? And I'm telling you, you don't have to tell the Indians the ripple effect of Ishmael's descendants. If you want to know who they are, ask me later. <laughs> um, that was a butterfly effect. Because it was supposed to have been, God had a plan. And poor Abraham, he's just like you and I. God, you need some help. We're in our 90s, all right? We're going to help you out. Uh, I guess you need some help. God said, let me tell you, this small, tiny decision you had, it's got a butterfly effect like you won't believe. This is how God works. But can I give you my favorite one? Let me find my Bible. My favorite ripple effect is going to come from, I don't know, you've read this story hundreds of times, I know. It's found in Matthew 25, if you'd like to turn there or take your phone there or whatever you got. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 31. You probably didn't know that you were reading a butterfly effect. Okay, don't make fun of my, <laughs> my slide there, but uh, read with me, if you will. And as we read, see if you remember the story. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, verse 31, all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne, and before Him all nations will be gathered and he's going to separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Remember that story? Okay, I, I knew you would. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Okay, what's the scene? It's judgment day, right? It's the day. And there's a group of people here, and Jesus says, I'm going to separate sheep from the goats. And as we read through this, I want you to notice how surprised both groups are. Okay? Let's go on. And so the king will say to those at his right, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundations of the world, for I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you visited me. I was naked, and you clothed me. Uh, then the righteous will say, just like I would have, just like you would have. You would have said, wait a minute, Jesus. When did that happen? <laughs> okay? I would have asked the same thing. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty or give thee drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome thee? When did we, when were you naked and clothe thee? And when did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king had this to say, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then he looked at the other group and he said this. 
depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You did not welcome me. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they would say, just like you would, just like I would. Wait a minute, Jesus. When did that happen? I never saw you in the ditch. I never saw you in prison. I did never see you hungry because if, it, if I did, Jesus, I'd have been the first in line. I'd have taken care of you. Jesus said, you don't understand. That stranger, when you didn't do it to that stranger that you did not know, had no relationship with, didn't have a clue who he was, that was me and you didn't know it. I don't blame them for being shocked. I want you to notice in the story that both sheep and goats were a little shocked. Because you know why? And I'm going to tread lightfully here. Because I don't know you well and you don't know me. But if I was writing this story with my tradition and the way I grew up in church, that's not the definition of sheep and goats. I would be going, wait a minute, Jesus. How about the five steps? And he could have went there. But guys, of all the things that Jesus used to illustrate who the sheep and the goats were, he never addressed the five steps. Not that they're not important. That's not why. Jesus was getting the heart of the matter. If you are in this place, if you treat people like this, all the other stuff is a breeze. That's the easy part. And then he says, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of these, you did not do it to me, and they will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my favorite butterfly effect. You know why? Because this is the way God has always done missions. You realize that? It was always those little things that you and I discount. Joe, I can't go to India. I'm not qualified. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Can you be compassionate? Can you have that relationship with your neighbor? With a stranger? And guess what? You're qualified. My hope is that of all the things I've told you about India and what we do, that you don't get down in the weeds so much that you can't see that mission work, whether it's in your backyard, or in India, or in Guyana, or in Central America, or the North or South Pole. Mission work is about the butterfly effect. Are you known for your love, for your compassion, not to those sitting in here, but to that stranger on the side of the road? And if you ask me, Joe, what, what do y'all do in India? The same thing you do in your backyard, in your neighborhoods. We just love people. And why do I stay in India? Because of those of you who saw that slide, that 1040, the Joshua Project slide, where do two-thirds of the world's poor live? In Asia? In that 1040 window? where we work. So it's no wonder butterfly effects everywhere. Man, I could quote you statistics. I was talking to Steve earlier before. Man, you want statistics? We've got them. But I think what makes us successful with working with God in the places that we do, 
are not our business ratio of dollars per conversion to judge effectiveness any other way than the way Jesus did, I think would be foolish. There's a lot of people in India that are thirsty, and we give them a drink. There's a lot of widows all over India. In fact, I've told some of you maybe already, half the congregations of some of our villages are, guess who? Widows. Because they're the ones with the least amount of hope. And Jesus has always worked through us to those people. And you know what happens next? Read Acts. Christians are persecuted in countries like India. Sometimes not directly. Sometimes it's indirectly. Sometimes it's through the caste system. Sometimes it's through the system I described that we see so often in India is by law, you have to go to the courthouse and tell them you're a Christian now. And you may have just lost your job in your community because the quota for Christians has filled up. Your kids may not make it to school now in a public school because of your decision to become a Christian. India is a prime example of a country, of a nation, of a group of people who fit so well Jesus' description of you want to do mission work? Have compassion to these people. You'll never get thanked. They can't afford to thank you properly. But you didn't do it to them. And this is, if you're like me, this is what you forget. When you hand that drink, when you visit that someone in prison, when you give clothing to that individual, today will you remind yourself it wasn't to a stranger? Jesus says, if you get what I just said, you did it for me. I give you credit later. I give you the credit for what the butterfly effect is about to do you didn't even know it. That's what excites me about mission work. It's not hard. It's not complicated. No PhDs required. But where's your love? Where's your compassion? And I assure you, the details of everything I had to say about India is all about we're just a group of people in Matthew 25 appreciating the butterfly effect. If you're here today and you have a need, I want you to know that this family here is a family of compassion and love, and you're in the right place. And this morning, whether it's obeying the gospel, if you need help with that, or if you need help, if you just need a hug, will you let us know? Will you let us know so we can have compassion on one another and let the butterfly effects go?